Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eileen Maman. Welcome of uh, new parents that I've not seen before or spoken to. Welcome old parents that I know. Welcome administrators, teachers, family members. Welcome students. Welcome everybody. Um, we're now going to have our five o'clock Thursday chat about education. And today's topic is going to be what did the interruption do to your child's education? So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of the academic implications and consequences. We're also going to speak next week more to the social um, and psychological implications of the fact that school is just abruptly um, terminated for your child. Okay, so I do need to cite some references. Um, um, I do need to cite some references. Uh, let me tell you something about myself, for those of you who don't know who I am. My name is Eileen Maman. I've taught in many school districts in California. Um, I uh, spoke, I work in the Pleasanton Unified School District. I work in the Dublin uh, Unified School District. I also worked in uh, San Jose. Um, and uh, a couple of other districts as well. Um, a startling fact that we're very much aware of is that all but one of California's K through 12 schools um, have closed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. What that means is that it's caused massive disruptions for the state's 6.2, 6.2 million students in all different grade levels. Um, Governor Newstrom announced the closures when they started, and we're not, it's, we're not even sure when school will actually resume. Um, the um, decision will rest with local officials. Um, if you check your school calendar, there's really no start date yet. Okay, so even though your children were in school, which school was technically in session, um, Distance learning is unlikely to fully compensate for lost time. So assuming that the schools are open next year, um, how detrimental will this pause be for student learning? And again, that's a big question, psychologically and socially. Today, we're going to just talk a little bit about the academic implications, OK? So, I want to say that learning time matters. I also want to say that face-to-face -face learning is the best way to come across to students, whether they be children or adults in college. It's the preferred way, especially when it comes to English, when a lot of the feedback is give and take as far as reading and writing. Okay. So, we also have studies that measure how students perform based on different when they took exams and days can have a large impact. Um, have a high schooler or have somebody that's school exam has been modified. The SATs and the ACTs are all actually stopped for a lot of the UC schools. So we're all affected by the emergency closures. Um, we were also affected by closures last year due to wildfires and other weather-related weather events. In other parts of the country where there's snow, we also have snow days. So we have a lot of time that our kids are not in school. So what we found to data from Maryland is that Schools fare worse on state exams in years with more weather-related closures, despite the closures accounting for only a week of instruction on average. I am sure that when students are tested on, S on SAT and ACT tests next year, I'm sure the interruption in the school year will also have a tremendous impact on how they perform in their next year in high school or in middle school. Okay, 
So when we consider the impact of individual student absences versus school-wide closures, the effect of closures are negligible. A lot of educators may find it easier to compensate for school-wide closures by adjusting or delaying lesson plans. And so we might be optimistic about that, but when we're thinking about our teachers in the school district and our tutors that see your children on a regular basis, mitigating entire months of lost instruction time will require a lot more than reorganizing lesson plans. It requires a brand new way of thinking and addressing student needs. And we all know that students don't learn the same. We all know that everybody's different. And we all know that the subjects that are being taught in school are very important. So I want to talk a little bit about, just to make my point, if you have questions or comments, please send them over to me. OK, I want to talk about what I consider to be summer learning loss. And summer learning loss is basically what happens to the child's learning abilities and habits after a long summer break, which is usually about 12 weeks. I'm an advocate, I always thought, personally, that we should have year-long education for a couple of reasons. I think 12 weeks of non-school sets up a lot of bad habits. I think we can visit our relatives far away in five to six to seven weeks. We don't need 12 weeks, where a lot of children wake up late, go to bed late, play video games, they're not writing, People are a lot more sloppy in their academic endeavors, including teachers as well. We kind of get hot, we kind of get tired, and our learning is paused because we're enjoying the summer. I personally believe that it should be a year-long school if we're going to compete with other countries to give the best education for our children. Why? Well, I think, first of all, we don't need 12 weeks. And second of all, I think if we continue school for a long period of time, we can have longer breaks in the middle, not just two weeks for Christmas break or a week off for spring break. We can take longer breaks, but again, I'm gonna address the short and long-term learning of a person. Um, when a child returns to school in August, they need about two to three to four weeks of review. That takes up learning time, important learning time. I think when we try under a normal circumstance, when we did have school open for the last months of school in 2019 and prior, the teachers have to get all this information in before the end of the school year. It's part of the curriculum. So the teachers jam it in and the students absorb it. But I think a lot of that is not fully absorbed or retained. I think it goes into short term memory. The child learns enough to pass a final, the child learns enough to finish the school project. In it goes, out it goes, it has to be retort. So I think when students return in August or September, not only are we, have we basically lost what was taught in April and May, but we basically have those bad habits and that long interim during the summer. So everything is review. Review can take a month. You're not learning new material, you're reinforcing prior material or learning it for the first time where it should be reinforced. Okay, so um, what can I do to help as a parent is one of my questions. Well, we can't do everything to help as parents, but we can recognize what's going on. So, we can't change the fact that we don't have full say in how long the school year is going to be. We don't know exactly how much your child retained. But what we do know is we can keep reinforcing good habits and good structure. And what that means is your child should be reading over the summer. Your child should be learning new information. Your child, if you, have, if you can afford and want to, not this year, I would imagine, take them on trips, have them write about it. Have them think about it. Have them take pictures and then give explanations. Um, engage them in activities that are not just passive. We want to engage them in activities that are active for their mind. Um, 
I would always reward my children when that they would read. So when they read a book, I would actually pay them for it. And then I would ask them questions about it. But that's the English teacher in me. So my kids calculated being kids, how much it would cost, how much they could earn by reading a couple of novels. And we did get the reading done. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about what I call summer learning loss. And I'm gonna throw out a number to everybody. This typical student loses about one month's worth of learning over the course of the summer. So we're gonna say May, May is gone. So I think more importantly, summer loss tend to be larger for disadvantaged students who have access to fewer resources and learning opportunities while away from school. So those are the children that don't have the same resources that your children have because they don't have the same resources, okay? So what I'm gonna say again, which complicates the matter further, is that that means that achievement gaps tend to grow during the summer. So we have the disadvantaged, more disadvantaged. We have the students that are not quite disadvantaged, lazy, if you don't mind me using that expression, and basically chilling out for 12 full weeks, which is equivalent to about three months, give or take. So, I am going to say that we're going to experience reversing gains achieved during the summer. So what that means is a lot of what your child learned, like we just mentioned, goes in and out. So I'm, I am worried about that. I am definitely concerned because if schools do remain closed for the remainder of the school year, which they have been, and maybe beyond that, we may face an even larger spring and summer loss. And spring and summer loss is going to be really hard to compensate, especially in the areas of English. Why English? Because English is exposure. English is writing. English is reading. It's a chore to a lot of students, but it's so basic to all your subjects. And parents that are immigrant parents or parents that don't know how to teach a child the novel or they don't know what to look for, or they assume their child understands it, um, are really at a loss, their child is reading, but what are they getting out of the reading? Okay. So I would like to say that this interruption of the school year is at the top of my list um, from having any loss in instructional days. Um, a question I have is, my kids are doing math, but don't want to write. Exactly. They don't want to write because writing is hard. Writing is the highest form of creativity. And another reason they may not want to write is because it takes so long. A good essay should not take two minutes. Oh, excuse me, a good paragraph should not take two minutes. Essays require formalized writing. English is seen as a chore. We have to get them to read books they like. Maybe it won't be a chore that way. And we have to insist, like eating and breathing and brushing your teeth, that you have to do a little bit each day. Case in point. I know for a fact, as I was in the district, that your child brings home math homework every single day. Your child does not bring home language arts homework every single day. And the language arts they do in class, as a parent, you very rarely see. So you really don't know if they're reading well until all of a sudden they take a test. You don't even know if they're writing well until one day the teacher calls or you're in back to school and you see your, your students writing you go, really, I didn't know that they wrote like that. I've been totally unaware. So we need to fix that little problem by writing and reading and practicing, just like math. Math is a sequence of events to get to your answer. Well, so is English. To write a good essay, it just doesn't fall from the clouds and end up in your lap. It's not gonna just happen because you want it to. And there's probably a lot of baggage where they don't feel good about it, or they're not interested in it, or they don't like it, which makes getting through that hurdle even harder. We have to make it a way of life. One of my big quests is getting boys to read. Um, girls usually are, um, and I hate to say this, I don't want to sound um, that I favor girls or boys, I don't, but I think girls are more literary in the sense that they're a lot more comfortable sitting down and taking a book out and kind of writing about it. They're a lot more fluid in their writing. 
I know boys do it too, but I know that they struggle. And I know that boys have a video game waiting as a reward or they've got their mouth that they want to do instead of. Now, I'm wrong in certain respects. Not everybody's like that, but that's the students that I usually see. Okay, no offense intended. Okay. I'm also going to say that, again, I'm very concerned about this interruption, and I, I'm also very concerned that because I don't know what to expect next year when your child starts their next grade level. So I'm going to also say that distance learning may help mitigate losses, but the state's most disadvantaged students may fail even further because of the, the, in the inequalities in access to computer equipment and internet connectivity. Okay. So another question here, my son is going to high school and daughter headed to middle school. I am concerned and love to hear from other parents. Absolutely. Parents, join us. This is a free flowing conversation. Yes, you have a reason to be concerned. Um, I was just having a conversation with my adult children. I've got four of them, got them all through college, got them all through high school. I am very glad that they're not in the middle of this epidemic disruption of learning. I don't know how you parents are doing it, but if I had my four kids at home and I had to worry about what they were learning, how they were learning it, it would be, I think, a disaster for me because my expectations are very high. I don't know what they'd be doing. All the computer. I'm not quite sure what I would do with all this, but I know that I would probably panic, which is what a lot of people are doing. Aside from the, the emotional and social implications of not seeing your friends, the peer pressure, academically, I would be very concerned that my child technically did not finish this grade in school. Okay, now I think what we need to do that we have control over, we can control that our children read and write because we make it mandatory. The first time you do that, it will be most uncomfortable. But praise them and let them know that writing is what I consider to be life. So if you think of reading and writing as breathing, it kind of works like this. Reading and understanding what you read is breathing in. Writing is exhaling and breathing what you're, what you're breathing out. So it's breathing in, inhaling, breathing out, exhaling. It's life. And to breathe well, you have to exercise, right? You get the air going. That's exercise in practice. So you need to, as a parent, while you still have as much control as you do, you need to get them to read and write. You need to insist on it or offer reward systems, however you do that as a family. Okay, so the other thing you wanna do to encourage people to read and write is to make it fun. Let them pick a book. Let them enjoy it. Um, have them find a quiet spot. Maybe they can take a snack. Just enjoy. Just sit back under a cozy umbrella outside. Make it fun and offer a little reward system. Um, so I think one way that we as parents and teachers and students can get through this is to support distant learning programs. I think that's super important. They're not gonna be perfect, but they are falling into place because we may be faced next year with a little bit of interactive learning in the classroom and a little bit of uh, learning online. So what our efforts are is to get kids to learn the best way they, they can with what we're faced with. So I think we need to give students better access to online learning. Um, I think we need to get, well, a couple of things in the disadvantaged neighborhoods provide free Wi-Fi and free laptops to those underdeprived students. But I think that's getting it in the right direction. It's almost like education for all, especially now that there is no teacher to moderate or watch these kids that don't have a computer, which we all take for granted. So I think policymakers also need to consider options for the recovering of lost time over the summer. We may have to tweak our schedule and evidence shows programs that offer more online learning time, both during the school year and in the summer. So I have no problem with children relaxing over the summer. 
In fact, I encourage it. I think children work hard. I think parents work hard. I think we need to stop our schedule a little bit and sit back, enjoy the weather, enjoy our families, enjoy, enjoy just having not, nothing so much to do. But do be aware that there is a consequence to that. If we only sit back and veg out, we will not strengthen what we've learned during the academic year, especially during this interruption. Okay. Um, the problem is relaxing for kids means screen time. Exactly. So a parent commented on that. It does. However, screen time can also be accessing an online classroom and learning English through online learning. It could also be reading a book through an ebook. It could also be discussing uh, news events online. It doesn't have to just be playing games. We can make screen learning academic. So I think that if we're thinking about rearranging school schedules and handing out free computers to disadvantaged kids, providing uh, free Wi-Fi, that may get expensive. It may not be the best strategy overall for all the people all the time, but I think that this disruption of the COVID-19 pandemic is going to justify extraordinary options for the children that have been disrupted and their families during this time, especially children that we want to educate and have parents in the house that are also earning a living online. We want to make online learning accessible and independent for the children so the parents don't have to hold their hand while they're learning, but the students reap the benefits of online learning. Um, I think we're in a brave new world here, and I think we need to figure out the best options and strategies for your child, because like it or not, this is where we are. Um, any questions out there from anybody? Um, Please don't be shy. We're all in this together. Um, I'll give you a moment to think about anything I might have said that might be of interest or you may want to comment on. Um, in closing, I would like to say there are online courses that, can, that will cement what they've learned and what they may lose over the pandemic and the summer. Um, your children are going to be out of school for probably about five months, March, April, May, June, July, and August. Um, we need to think about the implications of their next year. And we need to think about implications of where we are as an educational community and how much online is in our future. Any comments or questions? Next week, we are going to talk about the COVID-19 implications of the social and psychological aspects of your children having their year disrupted and all of a sudden finding them at home um, confused and um, they're not in their class any longer. No other thoughts or suggestions? I want to thank you all for joining me and please comment, um, speak to me either indirectly or directly and let me know your thoughts and thank you for listening. This is Eileen Mom and saying goodbye.